This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. I'm going to call the uh, Finance Committee meeting uh, to order today on February 25th, 2020 at 2.30 p.m. And um, all members are present, but one member is present by remote participation. So um, let the ref record reflect that um, Finance Committee member Lynn Griesmer is uh, attending remotely by a speakerphone on, uh, meeting on, on February 25th, 2020, because physical attendance would be unreasonably difficult under 940 Code of Mass Regulations 2910, subsection 5. Lynn, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, can all of those present here, Lynn. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, then let the record reflect that uh, Lynn's attendance by our speakerphone can be heard by all present at the meeting, and uh, so that enables us, with uh, full participation of the committee, to move forward. And uh, the first agenda item for today uh, that we're going to take up is the. Uh, I'm going to skip the uh, question of election of chair and let that happen a little bit later since I was elected to be chair through today's meeting uh, and uh, get straight to the presentation of the fiscal year 19 audit. Um, and uh, we have uh, Tanya Tanya, Campbell yep. from, Tanya uh, Campbell from Melanson Heath, and Heath here yes. today. Um, and uh, I'm gonna turn this over to her. And uh, Lynn, uh, she has a presentation that she's gonna be showing us on the screen and uh, everybody can will be able to see it as she goes along. And uh, you have that copy that I sent to you in advance. Uh, so, Tanya. Great, nice to see everyone. I'm here today to present the results of the town's fiscal year 2019 audit. Um, before we get into the actual statements themselves, I wanted to briefly discuss the nature of the audit, including some of the roles and responsibilities of the different parties involved. So for instance, the responsibilities of us as an in, um, independent auditor, as well as management, and um, the finance committee when ultimately acting in the audit committee fashion as of right now. Um, and then we'll look at some of the um, pages in the financial statements and discuss the issue in the town's management letter. I don't remember to flip this. Now, in terms of the roles and responsibilities of us as an independent auditor, our primary responsibility is to express an opinion on the town's financial statements. We're also responsible for planning and performing the audit to obtain reasonable assurance that the financial statements are free of material misstatement. Notice I do not say absolute assurance. An audit does not provide 100% assurance that every single potential issue that is occurring in the town or every um, balance will be looked at or transaction will be examined. That is not what an audit does. Instead, our, our audit is conducted under a set of standards known as government auditing standards. And those standards require that we plan and perform our audit using a concept known as materiality. Now, materiality will vary based on the size of the town. It also varies based on the different funds in, those, in the town. In fiscal year 2019, materiality for the town's general fund, your main operating fund, was about $140,000. That doesn't mean we don't look at anything below that amount, because we certainly do. It just means the standards say we should focus our testing on balances at or above that level. Now, something else to keep in mind, that having an audit does not relieve management of its responsibilities in terms of the financial statements. Sorry. 
manage, management and you know in terms of the audit is responsible for the financial statements. They're also responsible for establishing and maintaining in, um, effective internal controls over the financial reporting process and identifying and ensuring that the town complies with all applicable laws and regulations. Management is also responsible for making all financial records and other supporting documentation available to us during the audit in a timely fashion. And at the end of the audit, management is responsible for providing us with a letter that confirms the various representations that were made to us during the audit. Um, so for instance, if we're given something, they're verifying that it is indeed true copies of what was given or um, it does accurately reflect uh, ac or reflects accurate information, for instance. Now in terms of the finance committee's responsibilities when acting as an audit committee, you are responsible for assisting the council in oversight of the integrity of the financial statements themselves and also oversight of the internal controls and the town's risk assessment and evaluation process. Um, you're also responsible for educating the other council members in terms of the understanding of the statements themselves, you know, asking questions here today if there's um, things that come up and, and understanding the financial statements themselves. And also reviewing um, the management letter recommendations that are made by the independent auditors. Now, in terms of the financial statements themselves, they're presented under rules established by the Government Accounting Standards Board, also known as GASB. There are five components to the financial statements. There's the audit opinion, management's discussion and analysis, or also known as the MDNA, your government-wide statements, your fund basis statements, and the footnotes and other required supplementary information. Now, the audit opinion is the only part of the financial statement that actually belongs to us. And in fiscal year 2019, we issued the town an unqualified opinion on the financial statements, meaning that based on the results of our testing, we found that the town was in compliance with generally accepted accounting principles. After that comes the MDNA, which is a required narrative that essentially explains the financial statements as well as some of the key results of operations um, for the fiscal year. Um, there are certain components that are required to be reported in that section and we typically compile it on behalf of our clients. After that comes your two sets of financial statements themselves, your government-wide statements and your fund basis statements, which we'll take a look at um, in just a minute. And last comes your footnotes and the required supplementary information, which provides additional information and disclosures on the numbers that are actually reported in the government-wide and fund basis statements. All right. Now, this is an excerpt of the financial statements. It's page 15, if um, anyone wants to look along. And this is your balance sheet which is one of your fund basis statements. Now the fund basis um, statements are reported similar to how um, reports you would receive from the town on a monthly basis. It's, it's the same basis used to report um, the fund statements. If the first column there, um, which is labeled general, that is the town's general fund and the stabilization fund combined. They are required to be reported together for financial statement presentation purposes. To the right of that is the Ambulance Receipt Reserve Fund, which because of the activity in that fund, it's required to be reported as a major fund, so it is shown separately. And to the right of that is your non-major governmental funds, which uh, it's page 15, sorry. Just this section does. So how do we find it? I can't read the small stuff up there. Oh. I can read it from me. I just need to be on the right page. You're on the right page. It says assets, liabilities, and... Yes. But she says 
Oh, oh no, sorry. That those are just my notes off to the left hand side. Oh, that okay. area that's off to the right that kind of all looks column oh, columnar. Sorry. Yes, I just put that up there and I added notes for your reference there. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, sorry about that. Um, and the last column, which is the non-major governmental funds, includes all the town's um, special revenue funds, your capital project funds, and um, your trust funds, with exclusion of the OPEB trust fund. Now, in terms of some of the key numbers I want to talk about on this statement, down towards the bottom left there, you'll see the unassigned fund balance number of just over $17.5 million. That is made up of two components. The first um, is the town stabilization fund, which has about $9.7 million in it at the end of 2019. And that balance represents about 12% of the town's annual operating budget, which is a very healthy balance for a stabilization fund, one of the highest um, you know, percentages I've seen in a while. The other remaining um, 7.8 million is the town's general fund, unassigned or unreserved fund balance. Um, that is essentially like the starting point for the town's free cash calculation. Um, and that balance represents about 10% of the town's annual operating budget. Again, very healthy balance um, in, that, in, that, uh, in the general fund at the, as of the end of 2019. The other number I wanted to point out on this page, just because it was unusual, um, and it probably will be kind of a one-time thing, is the intergovernmental receivable in the general fund of about $1.4 million. That represents the June state aid that was received um, on July 3rd. So every city, town, district in the state received their state aid on July 3rd, which creates a wonderful... Um, it, receivable. You needed to book a receivable for it because it was not in cash as of um, 630. Um, but you have to record the revenue in the right fiscal year, so in order to do that, you have to offset it with a receivable. So if you were looking back at prior year financial statements, you wouldn't see a number like that, um, and hopefully there won't be that next year either. But <laughs> um, So I just wanted to point that out because it was kind of an anomaly this year. Does anyone have any... Uh, are there questions uh, about any of the numbers on this page or anything else about the fund basis? You said it was received on July 3rd. Uh, is it normally received before the beginning of the yeah. fiscal year? Yeah, it's the June 2019 state aid payment, and it typically is received before June 30th. I don't know what happened with their system this year, but everyone got it late, so... Is that it? Anyone else? All right. Now, this next slide is an excerpt from page 13 of the financial statements. And it's actually just the top half of the statement because the statement is so big, I broke it up into two sections. So when you're looking at it, it's called the statement of net position, and it's on page 13. Now, the statement of net position is one of the town's government-wide statements, which um, the government-wide statements only, they consolidate the funds together and only distinguish between governmental activities and business-type activities. Now, your governmental activities include all the funds that we were just looking at on the previous page, so your general fund, your grant fund, your capital project funds, plus the, um, the town's housing trust fund. Or, sorry, no, nope, health claims trust fund, excuse me. Um, which, although ended as of June 30th, 18, there was still some residual activity that flowed through that fund in 2019, and there was also activity related to um, workers' comp in that fund. The business type activities column represents the town's enterprise funds, so those are all consolidated together in, into one column as well. Now, the intent of the government-wide financial statements is to take your municipal operations and show them like a business which is okay, but you don't operate like a business. You cannot raise revenue like a business. Um, so they're not useful in terms of the day-to-day -day operations of the town per se, but they do do a good job in terms of showing the true assets and liabilities of the town. So in order to get between the fund basis statements and these statements, there's a bunch of 
um, entries that need to be done, including adding your capital assets and your long-term liabilities, such as your um, long-term debt and your pension and OPEB liabilities, for instance. So that's kind of the difference between the two. Um, on the far right, hand side of the page, you'll see the, there's a column for the discreetly presented component unit, which is the housing trust fund. Um, although that was established back in 2014, the, the um, trust did not really have material activity between 2014 and 2018. So it didn't make sense to perform additional procedures, you know, um, and uh, you know, charge town extra money in order to audit this when it really did not have material activity. So in 2019, it did have material activity. We did perform additional procedures. Um, we're showing it as a component unit in the town's financial statements, and we included additional disclosures in the financial statements related to um, the housing trust fund. Does anyone have any questions? Excuse me, did you yeah. say there's a line, there's a line item for housing? On the far right-hand side, it's called the discreetly presented component unit. Okay, and um, although it's not labeled housing, that's what it is? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it is. And I, I'll have a question about that later, but okay. continue. Okay. All right, so the next, next slide is the... The bottom half of the statement we were just looking at, which shows the long-term liabilities and um, the net pension, which is retained earnings. Now, I wanted to look at a couple numbers on this page. First, the net OPEB liability, which at the end of 2019 had a balance, or you know, was at a balance of about $53 million. That represents a $2 million increase from the previous year. Now, the same valuation was used between, in both years, the same actuarial assumptions were used in both years. The difference, be, or the reason it increased $2 million is based on your actuarial valuation. They're determining that um, retiree health insurance costs are $3 million. And then between the money that was put into the OPEB trust fund and the interest earned, that was approximately $1 million. So the costs minus what you put into the OPEB trust fund that represents your um, $2 million increase in the liability. Because the town is setting aside money, but it's not fully funding the annual cost of that liability every year. So just something to keep in mind. Um, and there is you know, no requirement to fund that liability at this time, um, but the town does have an OPEB trust fund. And at the end of 2019, there was approximately $6 million in that fund. So again, a very healthy balance in the OPEP Trust Fund, one of the highest ones we've seen from the cities and towns we audit. So, so that, is, um, that is good. Now, directly above that is the town's net pension liability, which represents the town's share of the Hampshire County Retirement System's um, unfunded liability. That liability at the end of 2019 was about $59 million which represents a $9 million increase from the prior year. Again, the same valuation was used in both years and um, same actuarial assumptions were used in both years. Um, the town overall represents about 20% of the total system, which also didn't really change um, between the two years. But during 2019, the system experienced um, investment losses during the year which was consistent with all the other systems we audited, we audited as well. It was not a good year for systems um, in calendar year 18, which is what's recorded in this, this statement. So the system itself was 64% funded in 2018, and it's now 59% funded in 2019. So that change in um, funding percentage caused the spike in the town's um, net pension liability. Yeah. When you're doing the audit, mm -hmm. the values are of how many people are retiring, how much is there, because I look backwards, how much is their salary increasing that allows you the evaluation of what's the pension going to cost? Those are all given to you. You're not 
making those decisions. They're coming from actuaries. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. So the actuaries and the system deal with that. And then the system itself has their own separate auditors, which audit that information. And then they provide the audit report to us, and we get the valuation as well. And we do test it, but not, not that. We don't test that part of it. OK. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. I, I, I've read this several times. Can you please explain what the deferred outflows of resources into pensions and the deferred inflows are? Sure. Yeah. Um, now, when this, we'll just take a uh, net pension liability for an example. Um, when the actuary determines what, um, um, what the liability is, they're making certain assumptions. So for instance, they're saying that the investment rate of return is going to be 7.5% for the year. When they go to do the next evaluation, they do a look back and say, OK, we said it was going to be 7.5%, but it was really 6.5%. So instead of adjusting for that all in one year, they amortize that difference um, the, over a period of five years. So when they do that, they create this deferral, and a piece of it each year gets flows down through into expense. You're not, your expense isn't going like this every couple of years. So that accumulates over time. Every time they do a new valuation, they do this analysis, and we, they say, OK, if it did better, then we're going to book um, this deferred outflow and amortize it over a period of time. If, they, if it did worse than we thought it was going to, we're going to book a deferred inflow and amortize it. So you end up with these, sometimes it does better, sometimes it does worse. And because of the accounting standard, you can't net them together. So you end up with deferred inflows and deferred outflows that get amortized over, the, over a period of like five or so years. Um, so those change every year along with the net pension liability which is why when you looked at the, one of your questions was, it looks like the, um, the net pension liability you know, changed by a million dollars. No, that's how much actually hit the expense itself, and that's because they're smoothing it out over a period of time, is essentially what the deferrals are trying to do. Does that make sense, kind of? Sense. Yeah, that was, that's, it's based on the accounting standard that is required um, did require you to book these liabilities. They didn't want to have these huge swings in your expenses um, every year. Yeah. Yeah. Dorothy? Yes. <clears throat> so um, part of me thinks um, that this is um, a way of making things look better than they are um, because we're told that we're better off than many other towns, but that doesn't mean that we're good. And I know that so many places are not funding their pensions properly, mm. and that many places, I guess was, I guess in the last 10 years ago when we had the last kind of crash, I think a lot of places were in very bad trouble. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the, the, the audit is telling us something relative to other places, but does it tell us in terms of what the gold standard would be? Well, from a town perspective, which things you can control, you know, you have a very healthy stabilization fund, you have a very healthy OPEB trust fund, you have a very healthy general fund balance. Now, unfortunately, your pension liability is kind of out of your control um, in a lot of ways. I mean, you're part of the discussion with the retirement system, but you don't really have a say in terms of how they invest their funds or how things are done um, from their end. Um, you know, there, there is a funding schedule for pension and it, you know, hopefully it won't continue to get pushed out. Um, they are trying to be, in the past five or so years, the actuaries are trying to be a little more conservative in their estimates. They used to have, um, rate of returns up to, you know, seven, eight, 9%, which clearly is not reasonable or going to happen. So they have kind of reined that in a little bit, um, but they can't do it super fast because they make a big change like that. It's going, you know, with a liability that big, a small change is going to 
cause a huge increase in the, the liability. So they are getting a little bit better about that, but, um, uh, but you know, you're kind of in a similar situation, obviously with all the other towns that are part of the Hampshire County Retirement System, but a lot of the other um, group systems like that, like Hamden County is only 47% funded. Um, it's, not, it's not unusual, unfortunately, at this point in time. It should feel like it should be better than that, but I don't know. I don't know if I answered your question, but yeah. I have just to build on, um, get another question related to Dorothy's concern. Do we, um, in actuary reports, do we get reports back that, um, of worst case scenarios? So by, so, suppose, you know, returns tanked, you know, so they were really low. How many years worth of retiree benefits have we reserved for so we could live through two really bad years um, as opposed to fail to pay? Right. Um, is there that kind of analysis? And I realize it's a whole system. Um, right. And I looked at some of the assumptions even on the flow in, so on OPEB uh, for what's happening in Medicare, it's a little on the high side on mm -hmm. expenses, which is great. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to be a little high on yep. expenses, yep. so you're lucky if you're coming in at three. Right. Um, so those kinds of what ifs? Um, I don't think they typically do that. What they do do, and it is reported in your financial statements, um, in your OPEB and pension notes, is they say, okay, we calculated um, health costs, you know, trend rates to be this. What if those rates went up one or down one? What would that do to your overall liability? Um, they do the same with the discount rate. So if you increase the discount rate by 1%, it does this. Um, so that, that was done to show like what, just by changing it 1%, how much of effect that can have on the overall liability. So they do do that, but they don't do separate calculations. Um, just because I feel like that would take them a lot of time and um, you could probably have them do that. Um, but it would, it would cost more money, I would think, for the town to have them do that, so. Is there not a state statute that uh, requires that the pension be fully funded by a set year, I think 2026 now? Is that right? Or yeah, there is a cutoff. I'm not sure what the exact date is off the top of my head, but there is a, a law that says it's supposed to be funded by a certain date. Um, and for the most part, my understanding is the actuaries are trying to fund it before then, so if they need to continue to push it out a little farther, it's, they're not already at that um, cutoff date. But I don't know, do you guys know what your schedule goes through at the, off the top of your head? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's past 26, but I'm not, I think there is a yeah, true cutoff date. Yeah, they keep extending it out as a way that they keep, the state the legislature keeps doing yeah. it. Um, yeah. Yeah, because I, I know if our, if the number went up, then we're further from the goal. Right. Right. And I don't know what the consequence is for the town, since we're the largest member of the system. I don't know. I mean, other than your liability is going to go up or your your annual funding cost is going to increase, um, which you should be prepared for. But, yep. Um, are there any other questions about OPEB or pension or anything else on this page? Okay. All right. Sorry, wrong button. Um, that was all I had for the financial statements themselves, unless anyone had any other specific questions. Um, I was going to take a look at the management letter, um, and I wanted to just briefly discuss, there's essentially three types of comments that can re be reported in a management letter. There are material weaknesses, which would be a deficiency in the town's um, control structure that is so great that there's a reasonable um, possibility that a material misstatement could occur and go undetected. The town does not have any of those in, um, in the management letter. Then kind of the next level down is a significant deficiency, which would be a deficiency in internal control that's kind of less severe than a material weakness, but still would warrant the attention of 
management, and those charged with governance. There are also none of those in the town's management letter this year. Lastly, there are just other recommendations um, for internal control improvements or procedural changes that you know, may not be of material concern, but they're still worth mentioning. And that is the comment that is um, in the town's management letter this year. Now, I didn't think to put it up in the presentation itself, but um, I don't know if you guys have copies of it, but I can just talk to it. There's only one issue in the town's management letter this year. Um, and as part of the audit process, uh, we work with management and um, in, in prior years, uh, the audit committee, um, to look at a couple different departments in the town and look at the internal controls over um, the cash receipt cycle. So the, the different departments that take in receipts, what is your process, where are receipts being stored, how, when are they being turned over, things along that line. Um, so this year we did a review of the Council on Aging and Senior Center. Um, and we had a couple um, issues that we noted and recommendations that we were, were going to make. So the um, senior center takes in a couple different types of receipts. And for each type of receipt that they bring in, they have a log that tracks what's being um, received. Now, funds are not turned over to the town on a daily basis, which is fine. Um, but when the funds are turned over, they're not totaling what they have on the receipt log and making sure what is on the receipt log agrees to what is being um, turned over to um, the treasurer and the accountant. So we just recommend that going forward that that be done in order to reconcile the two. Next, um, receipts are being stored in a locked desk drawer during the day and overnight. However, um, the key is just kind of left on the desk. So kind of defeats the purpose of having a locked drawer. Um, going forward, we either recommend that um, the key be kept elsewhere, or that the receipts or the yeah the receipts be kept in a different location, um, a more secure location. Um, next, one of the um, employees is responsible for kind of all parts of the receipt collection process. So they collect receipts, they record, they prepare the turnovers, um, and they record information on the receipt logs. So. Um, you know, for segregation of duties issues, you know, it is a small department, so we realize, you know, can't have one person kind of doing everything, but there needs to be um, more oversight, and that oversight needs to be documented um, during that, pro that whole process. Yes. Sorry, I just want to confirm that we still have Lynn. It sounded like we lost her. Lynn, can you hear us? I'm just going to reconnect. Okay. We can pause for a moment. Sure. Give people a chance to think about questions that they back. I'm back. Can you hear us? I, I can hear you, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, oh. thank you. Right. Yep, no problem. Um, uh, every month, the accounting department sends a monthly revenue report to each of the departments that collect receipts, and it is the department's responsibility to reconcile their records to the, um, the revenue reports or the amounts that are reported in the general ledger to make sure that what they turned over got posted in the correct account, things along that nature. Um, so that's currently not being done, so we recommend that, you know, that, that process be done on a monthly basis in order to reconcile between um, the department's records and the town's general ledger. And lastly, um, one of the employees of um, the department also does some administrative duties for the friends of the senior center, um, and we recommend that those kind of tasks for the town and the friends be kept separate, so either that someone else take care of the um, responsibilities for the friends of the senior center or that they be done kind of at a different, a different time of the day, because um, those two activities should not really um, be done together. So that was it. Lynn, we were talking about the management letter. I don't know when you got lost connection for a moment. Um, I, I lost connection uh, about the time you started going into the issues, but I've read the management letter, so I'm fine. Okay. okay. And I think that uh, town manager has indicated that uh, steps are being taken to address the issues raised. Okay. Okay. 
Yes. Okay, um, I don't want to back you up to the yep. number you had, but on That's the fine. housing trust, yes. the question I had is I was at a, um, how, how we account for the fact that the housing trust has cash available to us because it's been awarded a grant from the Community Preservation Act, okay. but hasn't spent it. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think it actually sits and earns interest in that account. It's managed by, so I don't know where those monies stay up because it's considerably more than what you show as the cash assets. So it may be something that, you know, so I just wondered, my considerable is like a half a million dollars, so it wasn't just a little bit more. So I just was okay. wondering where that shows up. When was that award? Was that before 6 30 19, or did that happen in the fiscal year or in now? It's, it was already awarded the previous year, you know, so it's, it's on the books but not spent for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, okay. No, no, this was toward um, potential use for working with the E Street development if they needed to it, so it wasn't for borrowing. Um, it was something they could draw down. You know, so I just was, you know, so they haven't, they were asked how much do you already have, and maybe it's, so they got $200,000 last year, but they already had a balance. So I just, my question is where, I know the CPA funds are a different stream of revenue than general mm -hmm. taxes, so I just was wondering where all of this shows yeah. up. So when um, CPA votes funds to go into the health, uh, into the housing trust, we do a transfer directly into the housing trust, but we have financials that show the balance in there, what's expended, what's put in there, so that's available if you want to see that. So they would have just had to ask us for the balance. Wasn't the, are, are, you, are we talking about an FY21 transfer? Remember that this is an FY19 audit. I, I can go back and check my okay. facts, but I believe the most recent round gave them an additional $200,000 in CPAC money, and they already had some. So together, they have this equivalent of a reserve waiting for, it's, it's earmarked for a particular kind of use, but it's not a loan, no. you know, and it's just not spent. Okay. I know. It, it's a question, you know, because I, you know, the, yes, so it's CPAC, so, we, so in general, you're, I think you're saying is CPAC shows up somewhere if the town is still holding those monies. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. That, that, I think that answers my question. It's I not, just wasn't I just sure. want to clarify, it's not turned over to them. It is in the town's treasury. Any expenditures would have to come through the town, so they'd have to go through all the processes that the town does. It doesn't get sent to them. It's not in a bank account that they hold. It's still in the town treasury. Right, the treasurer is the... Right, so there was $190,000 that was transferred into the Housing Trust Fund in fiscal year 19. Um, and that money is moved in the, in the bank account. So it goes between the town's bank account to the Housing Trust bank account. They earn their own interest. Um, it is set aside. So there could have been additional funds that happened after 630-19 that would be. That explains it. So you're, okay. you're just saying that would be in addition to the 222000 yes. you're showing. Okay. Yes. I have a question on page 43, and it could be that I just don't understand it, um, but it's, it's receivables, which I believe means it's owed, but you didn't get it. Mm -hmm. And um, my question is, how long are things kept on the books? Is that hand up for? Yeah. Back again. Sorry about that. It's okay. So, so I just was curious to know how long, it's a lot of money that's on the books that may never be received. Um, mm -hmm. And the question is, what is the, if something is owed and it doesn't get paid in five years, do you drop it or does it stay in there forever? No, well, it depends on what type of receivable it is. But the real estate taxes, that balance, majority of that balance is 
um, fiscal year 2019 receivables or 18. There is some, you know, hanging out there. But for the most part, the town, if if taxes aren't paid, they go through a liening process and they become um, tax liens, which is down here. Um, it's a large balance, but it really, in the grand scheme of things, um, your property tax outstanding balance is less than one and a half percent of your um, net levy. So it's a very small percentage. Um, your tax liens balance, again, is very small as well. Um, so for a town that has, you know, $80 million budget, that seems like a big number, but it's, it's um, very respectable in terms of what's outstanding. But there is a process for real estate um, receivables. If they're not paid, they get liened, and um, the treasurer attempts to collect those. Um, personal property taxes are, you know. Lynn has a question. No. Um, I think you're actually answering it, so okay. just continue. Okay. Personal property taxes, you know, cannot go through the leaning process, but the balance that's outstanding in those are, you know, very small. So um, those, you know, do eventually need to get written off, which is why the town has um, uh, allowance for uncollectible receivables, the overlay that they vote or that gets established every year, and that takes care of those um, balances. So you're welcome. Yep. Kathy. Okay, I have a question on page 20. Two, the enterprise funds, um, mm -hmm. and Bob had earlier asked about what showed up uh, as a net difference between revenues and expenses. Yeah. And my question is that it looks like where there's a net negative change in position, it gets made whole by pulling down the net position at the beginning year, the bottom two lines. Are those, in effect, reserves that each of the enterprise funds hold? Um, that is essentially like the retained earnings that's in the funds at the end of the year. So, um, and as I tried, I, did you see the responses that I Yeah, um, sent? I, I yeah. did, yeah. So it's a little confusing. These are um, full accrual basis. So we do, um, typically when the town bills out uh, receivables, it gets deferred. You don't recognize it as revenue until you actually receive the funds. But these statements are full accrual. So you recognize all the revenue and you recognize all the expenses. So. The main thing that's driving these losses um, this year would be your change in your net pension liability and your net OPEB liability because both of those went up. It's going to cause a bigger expense um, in fiscal year 19. So, but yes, yeah, so if you look at the bottom there, your net position, that is, that's a positive number and um, means you have that balance available, I guess. Um, uh, again, that is kind of inflated because these financial statements, similar to your government-wide statements, you book the assets as well. So it's, that is not, if you looked at the town's um, internal records, that's not what's in your sewer enterprise funds at the end of the year. Um, but they do all have, um, with the exception of landfill, have a positive balance at the end of the year. Yeah. Again, the, yeah. Just to follow up on that, if we looked over time, we would probably see annually yeah. pluses and minuses, mm -hmm. correct? Just based on the flows of, of revenues in and out. Yeah, and um, the changes in those, those big liabilities cause a big swing in that as well. But yeah, some years if your um, um, water and sewer you know, rates go up or usage is really high because it's a dry year, you know, you'll see those, those kind of trends over time too. questions? Yeah, I have a general question. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I've read this several times and I would like a little elaboration, but you state several times that you considered internal control over financial reporting as a basis for designing audit procedures, but not for the purpose of essentially evaluating the effectiveness of those controls. And I'd like, if you could kind of elaborate on the distinction between those two. Um, sure. So we, um, during the audit process, we um, evaluate the town's internal controls um, over the major transaction cycles. So your cash receipt cycle, the cash coming in the door, your cash disbursement cycle, your payroll cycle, for instance. Um, and then we 
test those controls throughout the year to make sure they're operating effectively. Um, so we do a couple different types of tests depending on what we're looking at. So we'll do random, um, look at 40 random vendor selections and make sure that invoices are signed, um, that the warrants are signed, everything's going through the right approval process, it's charged to an expense account that makes sense, um, things along that line. We also do that with payroll. Um, so we do evaluate the tr controls um, to make sure that there's no underlying issues that we would need to then increase our testing during the audit. However, we don't give an opinion on the town's internal controls. That's not part of the audit process. Um, we're giving an opinion on whether or not the town is compliant with generally accepted accounting principles. So any issues that would have come up in the internal control, we do report in the management letter, but it doesn't affect our audit opinion. Does that kind of answer? Yeah. Not really. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it seems to me if you find a problem mm -hmm. with internal controls yep. and you report it, you're sort of evaluating whether that's adequate, correct? Yes. Now, if we found an uh, underlying issue with your internal control process, we would have to do additional testing um, because from our perspective, we have to make sure that our audit risk is low enough that um, we can give an opinion on the financial statements. I mean, there, is, there are instances where we come in and there's no controls, no reconciliations done. We, we've had those audits before and we cannot give an opinion on the financial statements because we don't have, there's just not enough there. And um, So we're not giving an opinion on the internal controls, we're just saying that because of the lack of internal controls, we, we can't even audit this. Um, and we've never had that kind of an issue here, obviously. Um, so they're related, but they, um, they drive how we do the audit and what procedures we need to do and if we need to do additional procedures during the audit um, in order to give that opinion on the financial statements. That answer? <laughs> oh, okay, I'm sorry, maybe we can talk after or some, or what? Yeah, okay. Lynn has a comment? Yeah, it, it's really along these issues, and that is um, having seen many, many audits in three different organizations, and no, actually four. Um, it's, what, what the auditors do is they come as close to saying you need to fix this, but they don't cross the line. And that's because of the nature of what an audit does. So the fact that you've been very clear in the management letter that there would be areas for additional controls and i know the um um i know that the town manager is addressing this along with the new director of the senior center basically you sent up a flag of warning and the town's addressing it Other questions? Okay. Right. Around, no one, because I really appreciate your presentation again this year. Thank um, you. I think that it, uh, you raised a lot of questions to think about, particularly around the interplay between pension and OPEB, mm -hmm. that I think that we as a finance committee need to give some consideration to, um, but uh, I don't think there are questions that are going to be resolved today. No. If you figure it out, though, a lot of other towns would like to know the answer to, so. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's a question yeah. of a balance plan. I think what, what had happened because of since my years of service on the Finance Committee and the Select Board was that when Sandy Pooler was here, we moved towards um, a plan of trying to get the uh, Hampshire retirement system paid down and then with the idea that that money would then become available to mm -hmm. work on OPEB in a larger way. Yep. And it, it still seems to be a viable plan. It's just getting stretched out a little farther. Yeah. Yeah, and, it, and that does certainly make sense. I know a lot of places have taken that tact. You know, once we pay down this, this other big liability, then we're going to use those funds to, to fund the OPEB liability. Um, but you guys are, you know, 
doing a good job with the OPEB liability in terms of putting a decent amount in there every year that really, um, that really is impacting how your OPEB liability is being calculated, so. Well, thank you. So, anything else? Because I think that the uh, next things we'll do is, is to finish out our work is not a committee, but, you know, yeah. no, um, uh, you're welcome. It's an open meeting. You're welcome to stay. But, uh, no, that's fine. I understand. <laughs> All right. Nice to see you guys, too. Have a great Thank day. You. So I'm going to go back to the agenda for today's meeting. And, uh, I'm having trouble finding on SharePoint. Uh, what are you looking for on SharePoint? The meeting packet. I think Sonia just emailed it to us. I'm not sure it was ever loaded up on SharePoint. It was an email that came in a few days ago with all the pieces attached. I'm going to... I have all the... It was just to be reloaded. Can you switch it so that we can put things from... I, I can see if I can sign on and uh, get my computer up, which would take us a moment to do that. In the meantime, um, while I'm doing it, I think that the next questions that we had were related to audit. And I had sent a memo um, some weeks ago regarding. So, I'm sorry. Back. I had sent an audit, uh, a memo some weeks ago on three audit years and needing to pay attention to all three years. And, of course, the next year is the year that um, we're in now, and we need to um, be able to have a um, plan for what we're doing um, for the next year's audit. And then the, um, I think that, and I'll let, uh, if you're willing to speak to it, Pat, talk about what the former audit committee had suggested, which I think was the same direction that we were talking about, which was to um, authorize the continuation without going through the bidding process for one more year with our current audit firm who's been with us for some time, and then work on uh, setting up a process so that we can look at the uh, benefits and the uh, risks of uh, a change after we've gone through some kind of appropriate yeah, process. process. <laughs> yes. So, uh, I, is there anything else that you want to tell us about that? No, we would. Um, pardon me? Um, basically, you know, the committee was going to meet with Sonia to talk about an RFP for FY21. And that didn't happen yet. So that's something that this committee will need to do. So, but, uh, yeah, go ahead. I'm trying to get us set up on. Uh, uh, are we required by law to audit every year? Yes. I think that the answer to that is yes. Okay. In previous years, that was, that was not the case, right? It's driven by how much federal federal um, money we get. Okay. But I can't recall a year that we didn't. As long as I've been here, it's been an audit every year. Yeah. Um, so uh, we would. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, are we going to? I guess hear from the town manager on what area you think for the next, or maybe even the next two years, the, would have looked at? So, so we have not really discussed that. It sort of depends what the council wants to do in terms of next year's audit. Um, 
So last year we chose the senior center because there was a change of leadership there and I thought it was important to have a, an, a clear audit uh, during the change of leadership, you know, so the new person coming in can ha have sort of a clean look at everything. And that's why we had them do, do the senior center this year. Um, usually what we focus on are, are areas that, where there's cash involved because that's the thing that um, concerns me the most and that can be school lunch, it can be LSSC, it can be the uh, transfer station, any place that handles cash is the areas that we try to look at how we handle things because um, the general audit handles a lot of our sort of reporting requirements, it's our procedures uh, that we like to have them examine which they did a really good job of on the um, Senior Center and identified some things that were problematic that uh, that we will fix. So, uh, do you ha have you and Sonia come up with recommendation for this coming year? <laughs> Is there anything that the committee has identified that you would want to ask to be considered? Parking revenue? Have we done parking revenue in recent years? I don't. We could certainly do parking. Um, it, it's an internal operation, but usually we look at other outside departments, but parking is certainly one we could look at. Oh, we look at all the turnover policies and um, procedures from the police department. We've had them audited, the fire department, all the external departments that turn over money on a regular basis. It has to, it's financial um, processes that we look at. And is there one of those that hasn't been recycled for a while or anything like that? No, it's been a pretty yeah. rotation and it's been going for a while. Usually when there's a change in how we do collections. We also had them audit the second floor this year. Again, um, when they first switched over to some to the different permitting tracking system, we had them audit that just to help us to come up with better procedures for in there. But um, we kind of look at the last departments we've done and just if we or if we know there's a problem or if we want we know something, we'll send them to a certain department. Have you, have you done uh, targeted audits of the schools, the elementary school or regional, fairly recently? Yeah. So that's one you've, you have a, I imagine you have a list of, and then. Um, the region school, we don't audit. That's a separate entity. But for elementary, uh, our auditors go out there every year as part of auditing their accounts payable, all that stuff as well. School lunch program um, comes up quite often. So, why don't, yeah, really? Uh, maybe, <clears throat> maybe I miss this. Inspections were licenses and uh, rental permits and all that. We've done that? They were done this year as well. Okay. So, um, Let's turn back to the question of um, is there agreement that we are recommending um, to the council that um, a, an agreement be entered into for Palance and Heath for the next, for the fiscal year that we're currently in uh, so that Sonia can go ahead and uh, take care of finalizing that arrangement? Right, it's to sign a commitment letter since they have to um, schedule us in and we're usually in October. So if we could get that vote today, we could sign, Paul could sign a commitment letter for that, an engagement letter. And um, we have an RFP draft. It's been taking a while to pull it together. We haven't done an RFP for an audit in a while, so we've had to take a lot of pieces together and stuff. But we do have a good start, a good draft. And we were thinking, um, to probably put that out April, May, June time frame. Is that, 
or 21? Yeah, yeah. go on. Uh, I think it's a good idea, but I just have a question as to whether there are any restrictions on sole sourcing contracts or any maximum amounts or anything like that. Um, it's not a sole source. Uh, um, the auditing contracts are exempt from 30B, so there are no restrictions on that. It's up to us whether we do an RFP on that. I do want to say that this company has been pretty reasonable in price. We haven't really gone up in 10 years until we added the um, a few a few like we added the housing trust, so that's additional. But it really hasn't gone up at all. question could be for Pat or for anyone who can answer it, but last year uh, when there was a separate audit committee, I was trying to get a recollection of whether the audit committee made the decision to go ahead or whether that was referred back to the council. So uh, I think that what we would be looking for then is a somebody to uh, propose a motion that uh, we recommend to the town council pursuant to section 5.8 of the charter which i have placed up on the screen that uh, melanson heath be um, the, uh, that we retain melanson heath for the audit for FY20 and um, ask the uh, staff to go ahead and um, complete the commitment letter and uh, ask that that be put on the agenda for the next council meeting. No moved. Okay, is there a second for before? Or I just want to get a second and then come. Second. Okay, so there's a motion that's been made and seconded. Um, yes. Could you tell us how much the FY19 audit cost? Fifty-two five. Fifty-two thousand and five hundred dollars. They're here for a long time with multiple staff. Yes. Sure. Can you clarify fifty-two five? Fifty-two thousand five hundred dollars. Sharon, you're in the wrong business. Okay. Um, any discussion on the motion, additional to what we've already had? If not, I think we're ready to proceed. We will have to do a roll call vote because we have somebody here by remote participation and under. Um, the open meeting law it's required that there be a roll call vote of members. As usual, I always ask the uh, not voting members first whether they have anything that they would like to say to the rest of the committee um, on the motion on the floor before we go to the vote. So, here's. I just think it makes sense given the timing. <clears throat> okay. So, let's. Um, just go for a quick vote. Um, Lynn? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Pat? Yes. Dorothy? Yes. And I'll vote yes, so it's five to zero. And the unanimous vote, and we will report that to the, uh, to the council. Um, so then going back to the agenda, the other thing that was under the um, Agenda for for this was the auditor selection process for FY21, and you indicated that there is a um, letter underway. And I think that the the question is, uh, in addition to the, what Bob had rec referenced before, is whether it is good practice um, to periodically at least look to see if there's another auditor because uh, of just the benefit of having a fresh set of um, eyes looking at the books. Uh, we do know that there are cost challenges that we're going to have to deal with because 
There are only two qualified firms in Western Ma with offices in Western Massachusetts um, to do government accounting. And if we go outside of Western Massachusetts, we in, um, likely to drive up the cost. Yes. I just want to mention that um, as far as fresh set of eyes, we actually have that quite a bit with this company. They send out their um, field team, and that's always new people. There's at least two new people every year on that. So it is a fresh set of eyes, and it, they do pick up a lot of other things that the other auditors, I mean, that the other ones do. Uh, I still think it's a good idea to change auditors now and then just because different companies may have different things that they look at in, in a certain way, just for some change. Um, I think we can talk about that as we go through the process, if we're going to enter into a process. Um, a lot of the um, audit is done based upon um, accountants uh, GSB requirements and um, the um, all audit firms are having have to do the same thing which is ultimately audit to one set of standards that is uh, prescribed and that's not a choice so uh, yes Mary Lou I'm not sure how you work the uh, audit agreement for this year and, and they've done it before but is there such a thing as putting out an RFP for the two years with um, a reduction in cost for the second year because it's the same company yeah. so we can't dictate what the price is that they promote we, we can do a two-year or three-year engagement and they can put price points wherever they feel they need to. They might want to make it go higher or lower. It's up to the company submitting the bid. But, but the concept would be if you put it out that bid it for one year, two year, or three, you might see whether if you were willing to secure a contract for two years, the average rate is lower for each of the years, I think is what you're looking for. You know, so whether it's discount in year one or discount across the two years, right? Yes. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, we need to have this discussion when we get farther into the process, but I think we could go ahead and get into other um, matters now. Yes, did you have Lynn has a comment. Okay, well, um, I'll call Lynn in just a second then. Um, the, the point that I was going to just make is that my experience in being executive director and treasurer of nonprofit organizations that when we've gone out and looked for auditors in those circumstances that uh, first year bids sometimes um, come in as a lower amount to lure the uh, nonprofit into the contract and then they raise it in future years and that it's a uh, something to be careful of Lynn. Um. There, yeah, there's two comments. First of all, on the issue of pricing, I've never seen one go down in price. I've seen auditors come back with uh, very similar pricing from one year to the next. Um, and the um, so definitely that. The other thing, and, and I, I would prefer that we, you know, plan on going out for a bid. I do think that we should probably, you know, for FY21. Um, I do think we should do it for at least three years because of the learning curve. And uh, there are some are organizations, um, and particularly public ones, that require that you change auditors at least every 10 years. So I'm, I, it's a lot of work. And I, I, you know, from Sonia's position, I just have to say, adding a new auditor in is a dreaded moment. Um, but if we haven't had a new one, the real issue, and Sonia, you've spoken to this so, several times before, is frankly whether we can find another one that we can afford and is because, and they're in Western Mass. So I think a lot of it's, let's go through the process and see what happens. 
Yes, Bob. Another thing to consider, and, and I've, I've seen this in the contracts that I work on, is that you might have like a two-year period with an option year or an option year or two that the town could exercise so that if you wind up with somebody and you're really un dissatisfied with them, mm -hmm. you can just re reissue the RFP. You don't have to worry about the, the out years as much. So that's something to consider as well. Right. Right. Anything else on audit on uh, those fruit, fruit items two, three, and four on the agenda? Because if not, then I want to go ahead and uh, go to agenda item five, which is the second quarter report, and uh, turn that then over to, I don't know if you want to use this version for talking, or if you have anything that you want to add. Okay. Welcome. Okay, so hopefully everybody has seen this, had time to review it, has it in front of them or something. Um, but this report is also available on the town's website on our accounting page. Uh, this is the second quarter report and obviously we're halfway through the fiscal year and as expected in a perfect world. We'd like to see everything right around 50%. Um, our total revenues are currently, uh, revenues received to date through uh, December 31st are currently at 52.4% and our expenditures are currently at 52.7% of our approved FY20 budget projections. Again, this report just compares how we're doing compared to our current budget. Um, you will see most of our percentages are around that 50% mark, but I will point out a few things um, with some variances um, that are mostly related to timing issues. Not everything happens spread out nicely across a 12-month period. Um, some of our functions happen heavy at the beginning of a fiscal year or heavy at the end of a fiscal year. Um, so we can throw off these numbers, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a problem. Um, we're not concerned about any of the activities shown here at this time. They're all explainable and due to timing issues. So I'm just going to talk about a couple of them. On the revenue side, our investment income is currently at 77% uh, approximately. And this depends on the timing of our investments and when CDs mature and become um, uh, mature. So this is also, as, as the town does, our revenues are budgeted conservatively and with interest rates have been low for a very long time and we haven't really quite felt comfortable with bumping those estimates up yet. Um, our Cherry Hill revenues for the second half of last season, the um, golf season runs over two fiscal years. So our revenues are approximately 30% higher than they were at this time last year. But again, it's going to be very dependent how we end the year on what happens with the weather this spring and how good the golfing season is this spring to round out that. Um, motor vehicle excise tax, it shows up very, very low on the revenue side. That's because the vast majority of our bills are billed in February. Um, approximately 85% of the billing is in February, and those bills will be going out, as a matter of fact, later this week. So you will see that change dramatically over the next couple of months. Um, on the expense side, um, employee benefits, it's currently at, looks like we've spent 73.5% of that budget, but again, that's due to a timing issue. Um, we, several years back, the retirement system offered a 2% discount if you pay your assessment in full on July 1st versus making quarterly payments like we used to do, so that gets paid up um, on July 1st of each fiscal year. In the uh, information technology department, it also shows about 72%, and that's due to the timing of service contracts and annual software licensing agreements. Some of them are, many of them are due at the beginning of the fiscal year. We also set aside funds for the entire year to pay some of their invoices, um, and those will show up under the encumbrance column. Um, under the uh, miscellaneous and insurance section or category of the report. It shows that that is currently overspent, but that is again due to a timing issue. We have to do a very complex set of 
allocations to take the insurance costs and spread them out to the schools, the elementary schools, the library, and the enterprise funds, and that just has not been done yet to get that money back into there. Uh, snow and ice, it's currently, it's a beautiful day out, so hopefully we won't need much of that money anymore, but um, it also shows as being overspent because of contracts and purchase orders, which again show up under that encumbrance column, that we set aside enough money to cover sand, salt, chemicals for an entire year, and we are only going to spend what we need, obviously, and then that would be adjusted once the winter season is over. Uh, outdoor pools, again, is one of those ones that is due to timing issues. Um, the pools typically open at the end of June or early July, and they run through the summer months, end of August. So the majority of their expenses are all in July and August, and they're going to have m very little activity for the remainder of this fiscal year until the pools open back up. Um, so those are just a few of the highlights of some of the things that are farther off the 50% mark. Um, the, there's a lot more information in the letter. It explains many of the variances and the spreadsheets as well. So if you have any specific questions, we're happy to take them. Um, I had a couple, of, I don't know whether they're questions or comments on cannabis. Um, we are getting $98,000 in revenue from that. Is this the first time we've had a full six months have been able to look at since the couple places opened up or does this have less than six months i'm just looking at that as you know so i know the one up in north amherst rise opened months, right? up in Jul you know was open for july just after the students left you know but yeah Right, I believe it is just six months at this point. We've received two quarterly payments from the and it's, state. And we have on nothing that. really to compare it to, right? This is our, this is what six months yielded. Um, Not yet, right? With students around for at least the fall. <laughs> so if I can address that, they, they, it actually opened in May, but they didn't start relaying payments to us until this fiscal year. Uh, yeah. I, I noticed that the elementary education is only 38% spent, which seems kind of odd since it's kind of like a, you know, kind of a, there isn't much month-to-month -month variation, I wouldn't think, unless there's some other issues, you know, some other expenses in there that are one-time expenses or something like that. Would the, I'm not sure, but I mean, they're September, October, November, so they're only four months of the actual school being in session. So I would sort of expect it to be that way because okay. July and August, they have very little expenses. Some of the teachers take lump sum payments and get paid out in the prior fiscal year. They don't have a lot in their payroll for the first two months, so I would guess it would be in relation to that, but I can, I can check. Yeah, I would expect Payroll. most of the salaries are 12 month salaries. That's typically what people know. They're given the option. Some of them can, they can take a nine, is it nine or 10, a nine month payment or a 12 month payment. They can. When they take a nine-month payment, that are they eligible for the unemployment for the three months in the summer, or has that been resolved? That was an issue several years ago, maybe not in Amherst, but other places where they say they're only employed for the 180 days. Do we have that issue here? I don't know the answer to that question. We would have to go back and look at that. That would be handled on the school side. So, so it's usually not teachers. You're, we're talking about paraprofessionals and cafeteria workers typically in that situation. And this didn't happen in Amherst, but it was teachers in another area, another district. So I'm just curious if that's something that's been resolved statewide or if indeed people can do that. As a retired teacher, um, we, we have a contract for 180 days 
uh, we are not paid in the summer. So if we take a 12-month option, we're being, we're just getting a lump sum each month. Well, I know you understand that. But there is no in, new income for the uh, three months that we're not employed or the two and a half months that we're not employed. So you can claim uninsur um, unemployment insurance. So I had questions about two different departments. One was uh, back in snow and ice. I think that was uh, struck me about the snow and ice question was that if we spent 121.4% because we set aside an encumbrance for sand and salt, that a lot of that fund also has to be used on an as-needed basis for overtime when snow falls at the wrong time to get it done um, just during regular work hours. And uh, it just sort of struck me that uh, it was sort of a, almost a guarantee that we could be over the way it was, if it's handled that way. So we did talk about this this morning with DPW. Um, there has not been a, a big major snowfalls, but there have been a lot of small events that where they would be coming in at midnight or 4 a.m. to pre-treat the roads in anticipation of light snow. And just, um, so there were, we had a lot of little things that hardly re registered on our radar. There haven't been the big snows that we all remember, but they have been out a lot this, summer, this winter, oddly enough. So we would expect that uh, this could be a deficit year for snow and ice? Yes. Okay. Um, which is something we'll talk about at a later date, uh, no doubt. Is there anything else on that? Otherwise, I'll go to the other. No, this, no. I, I had a completely different line, yeah, so continue. Yeah, my other question is about the golf. Um, one of the things that keeps getting mentioned every year is, is that the demand for uh, golf has decreased nationally, that it is not just an Amherst phenomenon, though we hope that the loss of one course in town would help some. Uh, is there any indication that we need to revisit our uh, projections for golf course revenue? revenue? So we don't know the impact. So Hickory Ridge was open much of last year, almost all of last year. We don't know the impact of Hickory Ridge being closed, whether that will increase um, Cherry Hill revenue or not, uh, whether golfers who used Hickory Ridge will stay local or if they'll just choose a different golf course out of town. So I think it's something that we're monitoring. And I think you're right, Andy, is that nationwide golf revenue is going down. It's called the Tiger Wood effect is, has vanished. And you know, we've talked to professionals who've been running Hickory Ridge for a long time now, and they, that's one of the reasons that they are closing Hickory Ridge is that the business wasn't there. And what they, the operator of that course said is that the town of Amherst has two golf courses too many. And I think that's one of the things that we're keeping an eye out on in terms of the future for Cherry Hill. Yeah, and just right. answer your question on the revenue and, and um, we're looking at the revenue side. We have historically budgeted Cherry Hill, because um, it used to be an enterprise fund back a few years ago. We historically um, budget the revenues to cover all expenses, including benefits. So that's what we're still doing. So there's really two separate questions because that's one question, but the other is that regardless of whether you're uh, counting the revenue towards an enterprise fund as we used to do or towards uh, just a town department as we're doing now, we still want to have a reasonable number. And Staying on the golf course briefly, I know there's probably nothing we can do about this, but some UMass students came to an LSS meeting around the golf course because their team would have come to practice at Cherry Hill and paid a fee, but there was no food, <laughs> you know, so there was no, you know, because, so they instead, I think, are traveling by bus over to Northampton or so, something. It was an interesting, like, it was, and they had used, they used to play at Cher Hickory Ridge. You know, it was like they would have rather stayed local, so 
I have no idea if, as we say, if we want to keep it going or is there, you know, potential for revenues if something. You know, I don't know what the if might be. I had a, just a, a question on water fund, not because anything's unusual about it, but if I look at the revenues and then look at the expenses, they're both running a little under 50 percent, but the net is about $100,000 um, in terms of positive in a, in a good direction. When you look at a half year of an enterprise fund that way, does that can you start to say this is going to generate as much of a as a two hundred thousand dollar extra um, coming in, or does uh, December be is it too early? And you know, revenue one is at forty five percent of what it should be, and the other is at forty eight. Expenses are at forty eight, and revenues at forty five. And and there was some discussion in one document, probably the audit, that water use is down a bit. So whatever the rates are. But it was just a question, can you kind of look at those enterprise funds and get an early insight on uh, the, the net and the funds? Do you, I, I completely forgot to even mention the enterprise funds. That was going to be one of my closing remarks, too, and I kind of forgot it. Everything there is around 50 percent as well. Um, do you want to answer that, or do you want me to make a stab at it? So the enterprise funds are similar to some of our other funds as well, where there are some large encumbrances there for the year as well, chemicals to treat the water, um, chemicals to treat the wastewater, where we'll put in a very large encumbrance at the beginning of the year to cover those contracts, and they will be adjusted at the end of the year as well. So it is a good indication that we have a positive right now, but it it's, may not be the best indicator because some of those encumbrances won't be spent, some of those contracts won't be spent in full, and they'll be adjusted at year end as well. If there's anything you want to add. So I do want to mention that um, I've talked with the council president about having sort of an information session or uh, that's open to the counselors and finance committee to talk about uh, water and sewer rates because it's a complex topic. It's, you know, you're seeing in the headlines and all the papers now about how all the water and sewer rates in our neighboring communities are, are jumping up. And uh, we want to bring our consultant in to address some of the block rate questions that, that have been raised and where we think water and sewer rates are going. So we're looking at a Friday morning um, just uh, that people can, are able to come or we'll record it so people who can't be here can watch it as well. That's great because we, we got a partial answer when we were talking about the new plant, but Sonia said I'm not going to back up the, you know, asking like what does the 10 year rate projection look like when we bring the new plant online and have incurred those expenses. So I, I think having a sense of uh, what's in store, particularly as we're looking at other kinds of rates going up for residents would be useful for the council to know. Yeah. I was looking at the solid waste fund, of course, because a uh, large amount of the revenue is permits sold at the beginning of the year. That's always going to run at a uh, higher rate uh, at the beginning of the year when those permits are sold. Uh, it's interesting that the uh, percentage on the expense side is 38.5 percent. and. Uh, but I think that we're all kind of aware that some of their um, expenses are going to increase because of the um, problem of uh, removing, uh, of getting rid of the recycled material where we might actually have to be paying as opposed to receiving. And that will affect both sides. Um, so I think the other thing that we might need to have some time with at some point is uh, the discussion of the fund. I don't know if we will wait, you want to wait until um, you do your budget presentation because it will be in the budget presentation or if you mm -hmm. decide that it would be helpful to do it earlier. If you get one thing out of the way, we could do that too and I'll leave that as, uh, as you're not required to do it until after May 1st. Is there anything else on the second quarter report? Because otherwise, what I would propose that we do is, uh, Sonia's, I don't know how long Sonia can be with us, 
is that uh, we also had a uh, new version of the draft report, our projections for FY21. And uh, if there was anything you wanted to highlight from that other than the fact that uh, the deficit amount. Um, Okay. So th there's really not a lot to report on this. I just put it in there because I haven't sent it in for a while. But um, we're at the, I don't know if I've got the right one in front of me, so if the number's off a little bit, I apologize. We're about 300 and, no, 317,000 in the deficit right now. And the only thing that changed is we plugged in the governor's numbers for that. So um, in some of the other numbers of uh, retirement, we know what the retirement is, assessment is now. So that's in there. There's still um, also the region budget is down a little less than 2.5% which brings us to the 316, but is there any specific questions anybody would ask about this? That there's not so really. This, this now has the health insurance rates in it, or it, did you adjust them? Okay, health insurance rates don't affect this because okay. it affects the individual operating budget. So we pay, we all budget for health insurance um, appropriation within each of our budgets. So the two and a half percent is there. What that gives us is gives us more flexibility within the town budget and the school budget. Everybody's good. Anything else? Lost the page, so I'm going to try and go back to it. If, if I were to. Uh, say what I conclude looking at this as you're putting together the budget that's due to us on May 1st, you have to close a $317,000 deficit right now. Yes. Which is a lot better than closing a million dollar deficit. <laughs> okay. But it's not as good as zero. <laughs> okay. Still have ways to go because we still don't really know what the legislature is going to have to say. Right. And uh, I don't know if our new assessor is any is going to um, have the opportunity to do anything in looking at uh, projected new growth revenue. Right. That'll most likely go up a little bit. One of the biggest changes why we went from nine hundred thousand dollar deficit to three hundred thousand dollar deficit is when I did the projections for the October I assumed no increase in state revenue but I did increase two and a half percent on the assessment side because that always goes up I think this is the first time I've ever seen it go down so it went down first the two and a half percent went away and then there was the percentage that it went down so that was the big positive whether it stays that way we'll see Other, other questions right now on the projections? Because, yes. Okay. Um, what if we are going to go into a period of economic contraction? Uh, I mean, right now things are very unstable. They could get back up. I mean, I've, I've heard the news has everything that you can think of. It's going to stay, it's going to get worse, it's going to be, just come back soon. How, how are we, what would that mean for us? So our, our operations are pretty stable and it's driven by real estate. It's, it's, um, if, real, if the economy tanks, usually our big sources of revenue, if people stop buying cars uh, and if, our, if revenue from real estate goes down, if the values go down and we, people start to contract on things like that, they stop, our meals tax goes down, things like that. Um, 
so the economy, you know, fluctuations in the stock market don't really impact us that, that dramatically. Um, low um, interest rates and bond rates are helpful to us when we're borrowing funds. We're going out to borrow and pretty soon to renew some bonds. Mm -hmm. So um, we look at the long term, and our long term advi our advi financial advisor thinks that things will be pretty stable for the next year or so. I mean, uh, my fear has always been if we got to a period of large inflation and the pressures that large inflation would create for us, but as long as we haven't gotten there, so we that's, remain stable. That's why we don't want to spend all our reserves. Yeah, even though I didn't want to say anything when uh, the auditor was here, but uh, some of the the fact that we built up the reserve level we did was so that we could plan uh, for the major inv capital investments and be able to do bonding in a way that would um, have a smoothing effect on other capital so that we didn't have to sacrifice all other capital needs and we didn't have to go for uh, more override authorization for debt exclusion than we absolutely had to um, so that uh, there has been a strategy that's in place and we just uh, need to say hey we did a good job okay. uh, anything else on that because the the other major discussion and the only other thing that I um, anticipate us talking about today is the revised finance committee charge um, that was submitted to us for consideration by the uh, governance organization and legislation committee and uh, other than that um, as I have said before uh, major capital investment process I've been I've started placing that on every agenda as a placeholder so that we have an opportunity to discuss it if anything is happening at this point I don't think of anything that would be um, needed under that particular item at this meeting unless somebody else including the manager thinks that there's something to talk about I think we can just go on to the final agenda item okay Andy do you want to just skip over election of officers and move that to next time uh, actually thank you for bringing my attention because I had forgotten the top of the agenda um, Lynn, are you still there? I am. Um, do you, um, can you uh, take over for a minute even though you're not chairing the meeting, you're just, uh, maybe, or I'm trying to think how to do this so that we can, uh, or maybe I can ask. Uh, I can designate somebody, or you can just ask somebody there to elect an, a chair. We need to, um, I need to relinquish the chair for a few minutes so that we can do. Uh, do you want me to just do it? Yeah. Yeah. We'll ignore okay. the fact that, the, uh, the, that you're remotely participating. Right. So the floor is open for nominations for the chair of the finance committee. Do I hear any nominations? I will nominate Andy. Okay. I will and second that. Andy, yes. Andy, do you accept that nomination? I, uh, I will accept. I had indicated that I would... Uh, chair only one committee this next year, but that uh, if asked to chair this committee, this is the one I would choose. Okay. Are there any other nominations? Hearing none, uh, could I have a motion? Uh, Andy, is there anything you'd like to say more than you've just said? No, I think that it's been an uh, honor to be chosen for the uh, and uh, I hope that we have gotten through the first year of operations of a fi the Finance Committee in its new format in good stead and that uh, we can 
continue on that path for the uh, next year. Okay, then hearing none, uh, could I have a motion to elect Andy uh, Steinberg as chair of the finance committee? So moved. Is there a second? Second. And we have to do roll call. Athena? Pat? Yes. Lynn? Yes. Dorothy? Yes. Kathy? Yes. Andy? Yes. Okay. Then let's move on to the issue of, first of all, let me add also that as president of the council, I have to just say having Andy's experience as we've gone through this first year of the council and beyond has been just absolutely critical to uh, the smooth running of the financial side of our lives. Um, and I and I say that also to the entire committee uh, as well. This has been a very uh, thoughtful committee and a very well-run committee, and I appreciate that. Um, so any nominations, well, for, may I hear uh, nominations I for the, the position of vice president? Andy can take back charge. Take and... back the chair for vice ah, chair. there you go, Andy, go yeah. ahead. So is there a nomination for vice chair? Yep, Pat. And I second it. Kathy, are you willing to accept it? Yes, I'm definitely willing to accept it. And I, I guess one comment I want to make is how generously Andy's given up his time to explain things to me so I can be a partner rather than an underling or growing to be a partner rather than an underling. So I'm deeply appreciative of that. And you have been a great partner, which is why I'm pleased that you've accepted, you've been nominated, and um, you've indicated a willingness. Are there any other uh, nominations? If not, then is there a motion to uh, elect? I move that uh, Kathy Shane be elected as the vice chair of the Finance Committee. Okay, it's been mo moved and seconded. Uh, we can do a roll call vote now. Lynn? Yes. Pat? Yes. Dorothy? Yes. And I vote yes, and Kathy? Yes. Okay, so we have that taken care of, which then brings us back to the item that um, we still have before us, which is the uh, additional uh, are, are the, let's see if I've got the right place. The charge. <laughs> the, the charge is the, I'm just looking for it. Here it is. So um, we've been uh, suggested a charge, and um, the uh, it is before us. I think that um, I, maybe I should see what other people have to say. I had one section that I was wanting to highlight if nobody else did, but I want to see what other people have to suggest. Yes, Kathy. I, as Sandy knows, I didn't want to send it to people in advance, but I took the time to actually sit down and really read this. Um, so beyond the charge that we have with a couple changes, I've drafted some new language um, that I'd like to suggest we add to it. So I don't know how best to go through that. I can read it or I you could. Actually, you sent it to me. Do you I want did. me to put it yeah, on Yeah, so if you can put it up on the screen, that would be great because everyone can see it. And I'm happy to also email it to everyone, but I didn't want to do it in advance of the meeting. I'll try in a second. Um, I, I, you want me to, oh, you, I can't send it to you, right, because you don't have a computer there, right? You want to come look at mine? Are you sending it to me? No, that's great. Kathy? Yes. Yes, I'm sending it to you, Lynn. Thank you. I ask the under purpose, <clears throat> what does that added sentence do that we need? 
I just get it to, to, to Lynn, and I'll read it out loud. Added sentence that I put into purpose, and I'll read it out. You need your mic. Okay, so in the charter, um, there's a global statement that the Finance Committee shall consider any and all questions that it deems appropriate for the purpose of considering the budget. Um, so I think there's been a, uh, I think general and strong statements of purpose in a way um, make it less necessary to have lots of details underneath it, even though we have it. So I thought that that's literally a copy and paste from the charter. So it's not just advice, but to the extent we want to do an investigation or we want to think about revenue, so it's, it's a broad opening up. So I just found it a useful sentence to put into the purpose. A minor correction, I'm channeling Mandy Joe. It should say any or all questions. So that question needs to. I, I probably mistyped because I can't imagine that the charter has an error in it. <laughs> I think you're right, Pat. I didn't copy a maze. So I like your, your explanation. It's clear to me. I like it. I think it's a good statement. It's more inclusive of what needs to, what the finance committee needs to do. Yeah, I would agree. So should I continue? Um, I, I tried to flag them in yellow so people could see it. In the little header, it said budgets and appropriations, and I just put the word finances in. And the reason I did that is later on, I've added, um, um, I'll just skip down to the second to last bullet, uh, consider all other financial matters re related to the financial health of Amherst, including sources and potential sources of revenue. Um, so I think, you know, it's not that I have a specific idea in mind, but to the extent we had a, if we did the following, revenues would be higher, um, giving us permission to take a look at potential sources of revenue, not just this year's budget. So I just added budgets, finances, and appropriations because I wasn't sure it said that. Um, that's, it's probably budgets and appropriations would have been fine. Um, the next yellow down is the first part was in the existing, it's just that the town council is officially the water and sewer commission by the charter, so I just added that. But um, we need to review and hold hearings, um, so, and then make a recommendation to the council. So I just thought it was a fuller statement of we're holding hearings and then coming back unless my misunderstanding of, of how we would do this. Uh, so it's not just hold a hearing, but also make a recommendation, is what I added. Um, let me pause on that one, um, <clears throat> because I think this last year, um, the hearing was before the council as a whole, and the hearing is required to be noticed to the public in case any members of the public have comments about their water and sewer rates and information is presented through the hearing, the public hearing. Um, and uh, in previous years, the select board had always been the, um, convening public hearings for the same purpose. I think that there's a um, question of whether hearings for water and sewer rates really belong before the council and not the committee. 
As, as you see, I didn't change that wording. That was what we got. But um, uh, I don't know how we phrase that finance is driving it, but we're doing it as a committee of the whole, the way we've done a few of these things. So the original wording just said, upon referral from the council, review and hold hearings on water and sewer. That was the wording that was in before I added the yellow. So Andy, I, 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 I agree, you know, on the, um, is the council holding the hearings or is the finance committee with the, is the committee of the whole? And we've, we found a nice way to do that on the budget that we didn't have to hold, do something with finance and then something with council, but I'm fine with any. It's just, I thought if we were holding the hearings, then we'd have to make a recommendation to the council. So if the council's holding the hearing, this doesn't need to happen. I, I believe the council needs to hold the hearing because we, we are the water commissioners. We need to fix the wording that was in this charge. This is Bob. I would suggest we just make this language to be similar to um, the, the other bullets so that we're reviewing rates and making recommendations to the council. Not that we're holding. This is the only place where we talk about hearings. Okay. So you would just have the bullet begin review and hold, um, review water and sewer and other municipal, we don't really have other municipal utility rates at this point, unless we want to consider the solid waste, the, the fees charged at the solid waste fund. But and then it's simple, because it says re review the rates and make recommendations to the council. So it takes all of the rest of it out, yeah. Yeah, just the hearings. If we just take the hearings out, I think it's parallel with the others. Isn't solar something that has a rate? Yes, well, it's part of it. it uh, so is a suggestion to remove the words upon re referral from the town council and capacity of water and sewer commissioners um, and then and hold hearings? Do we need, really need to do it upon referral? Don't we no, I don't think so, because I think you'd want to bring it to the full council with something about the rates and recommendation. So, uh, you know, unless, Lynn, do you think it needs to be upon a referral from the council? I, I, if, we, if you are suggesting that we do the, these hearings versus the council, then I think you're going against the charter. No, we weren't, we're changing it to review water and sewer the rates and make recommendations to council. We took hearings completely out. That works. So and by the, the way, I, I still haven't received it, but that could be because where I am, the just, you know, everything's slow. So the question was, do we have to have the referral from the council to review the rates, or would we go ahead and do it and then get it to the council? Consistent with all the conversation last night, I'd say if referred. It just says, upon referral from the council, review water and particular bubble rights and make recommendations. Okay. okay. And then, um, what was the, what was meant up here where you had review and you, was that just an error? Probably, I don't know whether you've got a type, I had a typo. In. So we know that that needs to go back in. Uh, and going down to the next bullet, the original one we received that now in this version says make recommendations on proposed bylaws had a upon referral. Um, and I think our broad authority 
uh, says that we could take a look at proposed bylaws in terms of uh, any possible effect the measure will have on town revenues and expenses that what we're supposed to do is worry about this. So I just took out upon referral out of this one from the original draft. So let me explain why how that got in there and because this was actually the bullet that I said that I had some um, concerns about and uh, I think that what was um, the concern expressed by members of the GOL committee was that um, in the prior form of government at times the finance committee was making uh, recommendations regarding zoning provisions and when it saw that there were financial consequences, at times it did not. It was a judgment call that the Finance Committee was making each time. And uh, so I think that that was their thinking about this because they wanted to make sure that um, the concern wasn't that uh, the Finance Committee was looking at it, but um, it was actually in, in, dis in the discussion more along the lines of a concern that we did what we d um, did in the, both the housing policy and in percent for art, and that is to focus on financial consequences and not policy that's beyond financial consequences. So that was why they, um, I think, added that provision in. Um, and uh, if that's the concern, then the alternate language would be something like uh, consider the financial uh, of consequences of proposed bylaws, policies, or other measures, um, but something of that nature. But I think that that's where the quagmire was coming up. So I don't know if there are any comments on that. I'm looking to see, because I actually had, in my version of it, had written something out. I'm trying to look where I had put it. Oh, I might have been actually down. Oh, here it was. Upon referral by the council, provide information on proposed bylaws, including, and just leave it at that, it was another approach that I thought could be taken. Uh, Andy? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to suggest that we um, get copies of this and think about it and discuss it at our next meeting. Uh, the problem is, is that GOL is very anxious for <laughs> feedback and they wanted to take it before the council when they were dealing with all of the other committees yesterday. And um, the request was is that we give them feedback for their meeting tomorrow. Yes. We may have talked about this before, but I think it's really critical that the voting members be, have three-year terms. Finance committee is really critical, and people need, you, you, you learn. You may think you know a lot when you come on, but there is a lot to learn. There's historical knowledge that comes with that as you learn, and to have one year terms for voting members, just for me, it's not acceptable. And I think the council really needs to consider this as, as an important committee, just as the planning committee is. And I believe I was just told they have three-year terms, correct? If that is so, finance committee members from the council should have three-year terms, and you can stagger them to begin so that you're not all coming and going at the same time. But I really think that's essential, and people in town who know anything about the Finance Committee will say that is a very important committee, and just to have people
come in and go out isn't really acceptable. Um, I, I'd like to speak. <laughs> uh, the terms for any counselors with regard to standing committees or uh, the president and vice president are all, are all one year terms. According to the charter, it's only rules for the president and the vice president. There is also another group of thought on the council that everybody should serve on finance at some time. Well, that's a little difficult. And I, while I'm hearing what you're saying, uh, I don't see that as a viable option for the council. First of all, people like to switch around. We had one of those situations this year. Uh, and while we could um, appoint all of us for three years, uh, the reality is we don't know if all of us will be there in three years. Yeah. Is it, am I incorrect? I, I think there are only two year terms going forward. So the first uh, set of counselors were elected for three years, but going forward, there's only That's, two year terms. Correct. So if, if you're thinking about making a change, perhaps you should, um, we should consider it too. I think that's a problem with standing committees. Yeah. Counselors only serve for two year terms, yeah. so that. Only in the yeah. Correct. But some people will run again, and people who don't, their term is up, and somebody else will be appointed. I don't see these people, all of them, staying for three whole years. There, there will be people leaving the council, coming on, and I think there'll be a natural turnover. But in that turnover, hopefully, there will be somebody who will continue with the historical knowledge, as you have provided this year, Andy, and you, and you came off of the old finance committee. I think you're doomed if you don't have people who have some historical knowledge, know what's been done, and, and, and work with town staff on those kinds of things. So I, I'm pretty passionate about that, and I, I hear what you're saying, Lynn, but you know, plan, we think the planning board is important, and so we give them three-year terms. And the same thing's going to happen. Some will not run again, and so you'll have to put new people on. Well, I think that the other um, factor here is just that it's more like a legisl state legislature in that you have, or a Congress, that each time there's an election, even if you have some carryover because people get reelected, each council is a different council. So it's a question of whether one council can appoint members to serve on the standing committee for the next council. Yeah. And uh, that becomes, a, um, I think, a barrier. There is a question that you've raised, however, which is whether there would be a benefit in the future to make it two-year terms. Uh, just so that there's not unnecessary turnover. It doesn't stop somebody from saying they would like to resign from a committee. I don't think we can ever stop that from happening, in which case it would need to be a new selection. But uh, it, would be, it, it would be different from other standing committees, and you've stated the reasons why very clearly. What's the thought on that as far as including that in the recommendation? And then I want to get back to the other bullet we never finished. Um, I, yes. I think you can go ahead and recommend it to GOL. I think we are going to, um, I think it'll create quite a discussion. We could, uh, we could include it as a, dis a discussion item that happened, but that we did not vote a recommendation on it, um, if that's what the committee wishes. Um, Andy? Yes. I, I think that's a good way. Um, I think we should include it as a recommendation for two-year terms, because most of us know that the first year is an extraordinarily heavy learning curve. and. Um, I think two year is good, but we can't enforce that. But I think that the fact that we've discussed it and um, thought it had some virtue to let GOL do what it does. Well, the council's going to be the ones that decide, but GOL can come back or whatever they're going to do. Um, I just want to be very clear that I 
I think I think your recommendation that it just be part of our minutes is the right one. Uh, yeah, I can I can concur that having served on this committee for less than a year, the learning curve is rather steep, and it would be very helpful to have continuity for more than a year. Yes. I'm off of that one. Uh, under uh, composition, where it says the uh, non-voting members, I would insert after municipal, in parentheses, town and schools. The biggest cost in town are the schools. So I think that there needs to be, it could be town or schools, but I think the schools have to be in there when we say municipal. People think only in terms of the town, and it is schools also. Um, I guess that, uh, why is that different? Because in Massachusetts municipalities, they always it, schools are included in public finance as part of. I guess. Would, uh, it's under composition. So it, so the sentence. Okay, so let me go back. We're jumping around a little bit. I'm a little bit concerned about that because it's making it more difficult, actually, because we never concluded um this bullet so let me get back yeah we did um uh, no it's up here municipal That was where you were talking about. I can help clean it up once you uh, Yeah, I'm do just the, doing it as we're going along. Yeah. Um, so let's get back to this one uh, that we had, had consider all financial matters related I, I now have it. I just got it. Sorry, Lynn, the delay was the, I couldn't connect with the town internet. <laughs> I had to reboot. All right, so what do you want me to look at? Um, this, there's second to last bullet under the um, budget and appropriations is a new bullet, consider all other financial measures related to the financial health of Amherst, comma, including sources or potential sources of revenue and the town debt capacity. Yes. I guess, again, I think we should have parallel construction here yeah. to say consider and make recommendations or something okay. to that effect. Yeah. yeah. I also, by the way, it should say the health of the of town of Amherst. I, I do, really don't want to be in charge of the whole, all of Amherst, just the town of Amherst. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and parallel structure is, is very important. There's... Kathy's usually very considerate about that. All right, so I just want to make sure that. So the alternate language that I had said was come up with to address some of the concern that was coming out of GOL was um, that it not be make recommendations but provide information. That way, this fear that we might come in and recommend. Uh, against a bylaw in con that another committee has recommended for 
is where, as opposed to just providing information on financial consequences, that's what you're going to get the pushback from. I, but I, Andy, I have no problem if two committees don't agree. Uh, in fact, that's what's a good check and balance system. And if somebody comes forward with a bylaw and then we look at it from a standpoint of finance and, and point out the issues around it and therefore vote a certain way, then I think that's our responsibility. So you would, in five years time, was to start with make recommendations? Yeah. yeah, I, yeah. Consider, you could say consider and no. make recommendations or something like that. Yeah. No. Or just make recommendations is fine. Take recommendations. In, in theory, you'd like us to analyze and make recommendations, but we don't have to get that wonky about it, right? <laughs> in, in this piece, was there a reason that you had taken out measures? I, I sent you a second one, but it didn't go through. I just somehow clipped the whole ending. So it was supposed to be exactly their wording with just that initial upon referral. Out. So I didn't try to change any of the rest of the word wording. So make recommendations on proposed bylaws, including revisions, policies, or other measures under council consideration with regard to the effect the measure will have on town revenues, expenses, or finances. So I didn't try to change that. But one, the first version I did to Andy and tried to print it out for all of you, truncated an entire sentence. So that I failed to print because there was no printer toner left in my printer. <laughs> and then the last bullet, you want to explain that? Okay, so it, maybe we don't need this, but we were holding public hearings related to public as, as uh, to be held with the council as a committee of the whole. So maybe we just don't need to add that bullet, but that was the practice we adopted during the past year. So I just the, isn't that get us back to the charter? Okay. Which which may be held, right? So, you know, we. So when when, for example, when we did the temporary bridge, Andy, you ran the meeting but it was a hearing of the, the whole. So I don't know how we've, maybe we just don't need that bullet. The, I don't think we need it, but with the word may there, so, so you mean will be, will be held? So it means will, you want will be held. Is you well, I don't I think, okay, so maybe we, we don't we, need before it. Before we jump out of this uh, one, we have to get back to the right section of the, uh, I'd looking be happy at, with. I'm looking at the charter. Uh, I think it's. I'd be happy removing it. It's just we, with the temporary bridge, we held a hearing, you know, so. Um. I don't think it has to be here. I think it's going to raise all kinds of. Okay, delete it. I, I rescind. This sentence altogether, gone. I just want to make. I mean, Andy, um, my, my. Yeah. And just. I think it's fine to delete it. You know, we figured it out for each of these hearings, the exact format, how we were going to do it. So, I mean, it was always the. Everyone from the council was invited. Um, I mean, was asked to be there. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to say I'm personally uncomfortable with the finance committee holding public hearings. I think the yeah. council should be the one that holds public hearings. Good. It's gone. I did. Yes. I deleted it. From no. My... Here's. A, oh wait, wait a minute. Oops. I keep. The finance committee shall hold a public hearing. This is under 5.5a. The Finance Committee shall hold a public hearing on the proposed budget, providing no less than 10 days notice of such hearing. The Finance Committee will re thoroughly review the budget. So there is a provision in the charter. I think that's why I, I, think that's that's why I thought that's the way we did it. <laughs> I, I, think, I think the charge should really relate to the okay. charter. Yeah. 
whatever is consistent with the charter. Um, uh, um, how about uh, hold all public hearings relating to the budget as required by Charter Section 5.5A? Yeah, I like that. Then it's tied back to the charter. Right, yes. We'll let Kathy, you got that one? Yes. Okay, because I, I didn't uh, enter it. Is there, let's see now whether there was anything else. It is 5.5A. Yes, and I apologize to all of you for not being even faster with the computer than I am. But uh, well, the, what I typed on mine is hold public hearing related to the budget as required by Charter Section 5.5A. Okay, that's clear. I got, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I have to go. <laughs> I think we're just about done, actually. Is there anything else that you had, Kathy, on yours? And then I think we're. No, that was it. So, um, do we um, want to ta have a motion to just uh, forward these recommendations to the uh, GOL for their consideration tomorrow and uh, that we will not change the one on terms, but we will put in a, uh, uh, an explanatory section that we think that it should be considered because of the reasons that Mary Lou has indicated. I move to do what you just said. So s send this revised version. Okay. And I've got it in track changes. There's and been a motion made and seconded real quickly then so we can get to a vote and be done. Um, Lynn? Yes. Pat? Dorothy? Yes. Uh, Kathy? Yes. And I uh, just, did, were there any comments? I should have asked you if you had additional comments you'd like to. Can you just, you're, I assume you're just going to send around the revised one to all yes. of you as well. Yes, I'll send yes. it. And, and the one I've got, I'm going to send it what I call clean, but also the track changes so you can see under, if you want to look at the mess. Um. <laughs> and uh, then uh, Kathy and I will work it out. So there's no public uh, public comment. There's no other business that uh, we needed to consider that was not previously on the agenda. I think we're ready to adjourn. Yeah. Yes. At what point will we be able to talk about the major capital investment uh, process before everything gets rolling along? I mean, do you have that as a time certain? No, we I do don't not. have a time certain, but I will be. I'm, I'm working towards a time certain. How's that? I, I think that's the best thing I can do. Yeah, uh, we, I should be able to provide an update about the library fairly soon. Yeah, I mean, there's too many moving pieces right now, and it's just why we keep uh, putting it on the agenda but not getting there. Okay, so I think we had a motion on, uh, that's been made to, to adjourn, and uh, I think I'm just going to declare us adjourned.